Good to see each all these smiling faces. Happy to be here. Amen. If you're glad you're in church tonight, say amen. 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 Let's all stand if you would. Take your hymn books and turn to 195. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. 195. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to you. Thy faithfulness with my mouth will I make known. Thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Brother Spangler, would you pray over our service for us? Amen. Take your hymn books and turn to 200. You may be seated. Turn to 215. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. 215. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away. And my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal 
from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Thank you for your good singing. Amen. Good evening. Good to see you guys. Hope you're doing well tonight. Glad you could make it. And glad to have some guests with us this evening. If you're joining us through live stream, we're glad that you're joining us as well. And if you're looking for a church to call home, we pray that you'll consider independent. A couple of things to keep uh, in your mind. Um, this coming Sunday night is our school night service here at the church, 6 p.m. And that'll be our evening service. I'm looking forward to it. And we've been getting ready for it and all kind of stuff. I know the kids have been practicing and I've been hearing them. They're going to do some practicing tomorrow. Um, I also have some sign-up sheets up for um, Sunday the 30th. Uh, Sunday, May 30th. That's not this coming Sunday, but the following we're going to have a dinner on the grounds following our morning service, and there's some sign-ups there. I've got a couple volunteers to help cook chicken, and I need probably one more. So I've got Monica, Melinda has offered, Miss Marina. I need another uh, volunteer between now and Sunday, if you want to think about it. We'll announce it again on Sunday. Um, a lady who can help me cook, or man, I'm not prejudiced. Um, help me cook some chicken, and um, what we're going to do is the church is going to provide the chicken, and uh, hot dogs and we can grill the hot dogs they don't take long and then if you'll sign up for a side item or a casserole <coughs> or a dessert or a pie or a dessert um, that'd be good oh did I say that twice no um, so uh, think about what you want to bring if you're able to come come and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a, a lunch here on the grounds together and then stick around for an afternoon service and there's a sign-up sheet back there for that as well um, if you'd like to be involved in the song service and um, participate in the singing, a song, a hymn, or a spiritual song. That's what the scripture says, right? And so one of those, if you'd like to be involved, sign up. If you need accompaniment, Mrs. Tyner said she's available. Uh, be sure to get with her for enough time. And then um, on the 28th is our next youth meeting. It's going to be in Wachula. And so be in prayer about that as it gets closer. We're taking the youth over to Maranatha Baptist Church, and they're studying for a Bible quiz over Romans 4. Romans 4, right? Youth? Yes. You guys have that whole chapter memorized, right? Okay. <laughs> and um, so last, la I want to see if we can get that trophy to come back here, and um, it would be kind of nice. It's, there's some really stiff competition. If you guys want to see good competition, you should come with us to one of the youth meetings. And um, this would be a good one to go to over at Maranatha Baptist Church. You'd be welcome to come. It's kids of all ages. And um, so anyway, 7 o'clock that Friday, the 28th, and then uh, that Sunday, the 30th, we're having the dinner on the grounds. All right. Um, we have a prayer letter from uh, the sea bass tonight. Melinda, would you come read that for us, please? This is our March and April uh, prayer letter. This is Dear Pastor, Supporters, and Praying Friends, Romans 12, 13a, Distributing to the Necessity of the Saints. As we continue to gain access and more time inside the prison gates, I am reminded that these people had a great spiritual lack during the pandemic. When the need was the greatest, they had to travel the mountain alone. They continue to express their thanks for our being there. Please continue to pray as we encourage these believers from within and gain access to other to and gain access to other opportunities to minister to these desperate, desiring fellowship fellowship and encouragement in the Lord. Can you tell me how I can live for the Lord? Can I become a missionary when I get out? These are some of the questions 
we get from some of the young men and women who we have in our class. We have been blown away by the new weekly class and service in youth, youthful offenders dorm. Our hearts break as we watch them stare after us as we leave with the promise to return next time. The truth is, if you just do, uh, the truth is they just do not want you to leave. The desire to serve God, their desire to serve God is muted by their uh, surroundings. We pray this is their desire to learn more about the Lord will continue to stir their hearts and God's spirit has a continued victory. We are praying for a revival to break out. We sense that those that come to our class are searching and have tender hearts. The men have been growing spiritually each week and asking for more teaching and preaching. Each week before the service begins, several are at the altar already praying. They are calling for God to bless the officers and the prison leaders. Though, these hold, though they hold them, the gospel and testimony of, of prevailing importance. We had our first revival since COVID-19 shut down the prisons. We had an all-day meeting in Miami. By God's grace, we saw 33 men make a profession of faith in the Lord. Unfortunately, we did not make it to the Yo dorm due to some issues going on. We are planning another meeting in a couple of months. Each time we go, we have new men come and they are, are stuffed into a room with too, with too many. They are very hungry for God's word. Since our last letter, we have had a total of 52 professions of faith and a great many desiring to be servants of God of, of Christ. Please pray for the those who will be released soon. I'm supposed to meet with them and get them placed in a local church. Please pray for them as they make this transition. This is from Miss Janet. In April, I went back into the Lowell to teach and was excited to get back to see the ladies. I asked one of the volunteers a dear friend to come with me for the first time as I was not sure how it would go. At the annex, we had two women that had recently lost loved ones as well. We spent time uh, praying over their prayer requests and their, sweet, uh, and their sweet spirit. My first time back was also our first time in the Yo dorm. It was nice to see some familiar faces, but most of them are new to us. They are eager and excited to sing some of the choruses. One young lady was singing loudly off key because she did not know the song, but she wanted to make sure that those that did not come could hear the uh, convicting words. The things I used to do, I do not do them anymore since I've been born again. She later received the Lord as her Savior. Please continue to pray for our weekly meetings at the women's prison. Your are unaware, un unwavering prayers and encouragement and support are greatly appreciated. In his service, Glenn and Janet Seabass. I've always enjoyed the ministry of the Seabasses when they come. Let's all take our hymn books once again and turn to 173, and I appreciate your prayers for your song leader. I don't know where his throat's going, and I'm not sure where his nose's going, but we sure could use a touch from the Lord tonight. 173, love lifted me. Was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply staying within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. 
when nothing else could help love lifted me love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me all my heart to him i give ever to him i cling in his blessed presence live ever his praises sing love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song Faithful, loving service to, to him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Millows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Thank you for your good singing. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to this headpiece, dear. Prayer sheets. Take your prayer sheets out tonight. A couple of prayer requests I'd like to bring to your attention. And um, some praises as well. Um, Brother Wayne Mott had surgery on Monday. Took him to the hospital and his surgery got pushed back. He didn't make it home till late in the evening. Uh, but he had a hernia surgery. Judah, why don't you get up and go back and sit right back there by Jossie and Grammy. Go ahead and hustle. Thank you. That'll be easier for you. Um, he made it home safely, and um, surgery went well, but he's dealing with some soreness, he said, so be in prayer for Brother Mott, and they're going to be following tonight. If you're following tonight, Brother, love you. We're praying for you. Um, also be in prayer for Larry Lee at work. He burned his feet, and um, he's got blisters on the bottoms of his feet. Um, and he has a neuropathy, so he's got some loss of sensation, didn't realize it was happening. And so he's laid up at home, be in prayer for him. Beth called me today and just let me know. And um, they got to go see a doctor, I forget exactly when, uh, but getting, him, getting his feet healed up is going to be a concern. So pray for Larry. He already deals with neuropathy and some other issues with his feet. And so uh, pray for him. He's uh, got his feet uh, taken care of them, Larry. We're praying for you, brother. Um, and then be in prayer for Beth. They have a maintenance man there at the park who they work with. So Brother Larry's laid up, and then their maintenance man didn't show up today. And so they're shorthanded, so be in prayer for them. Uh, the elders were on their way back from Orlando. They were going to try and make it tonight. Um, had some tests, and um, keep the elders in prayer if you would. And then Miss Rita Smith. Miss Rita Smith had, heart, uh, had a heart test today. And she had been scheduled for that to see if she had any blockages. Good news, she has said she has no blockages. And so she texted and put it online a little bit earlier today. And we're praying for you, Miss Rita. I know they follow the services when they're not here. Um, also, Wade Lindley, he has a similar situation to what Bob Fielder does with his legs. And um, he has had a stent put in his leg before. 
This was a mechanical failure. He had a, a problem. The stent blocked or the, the, the vein got kinked or something, developed severe pain, went into the hospital, and um, he just made it home today. And so he's at home. Wade Lindley's at home. I talked to Rhonda just a little bit ago and pray for him as he recovers. Um, and then Herman and Barbara Stahl um, have been coming for a bit. Now, they haven't been in the services the past few weeks. They took a visit to be with their grandkids up in Jacksonville. Miss Barbara hurt her back, and she's got a ruptured disc, I believe. And so be in prayer for Miss Barbara Stahl. It's a chronic problem. Uh, one that they've been managing, but the pain has just gotten to be difficult lately. So pray for both of them. And then pray for Bethel Baptist Church right down the road from us. They're going through a real difficult time right now, uh, continuing to. Uh, Bethel Baptist Church, Pastor Sean Weiland, Ida Weiland, he's the pastor there. That's where uh, Pastor Hankins goes. Pastor Hankins goes to Bethel Baptist. And Bethel Baptist is a plant out of Independent. And we've helped them at... From time to time, we've prayed for them. Continue to pray for them, if you would. Um, any other prayer requests tonight? Revisions, answers to prayer, anything to mention? Melinda? Just keep praying for Bill Duster. He had two more treatments to go. And then after he had finished with his last treatment, he goes to the oncologist here in Sebring. And we'll let you know what, what happened from there. Okay, be in prayer for but, Bill. All right, keep Brother Bill in prayer. He's dealing with cancer right now. Two more treatments. Let's pray that those go well. We're praying for you guys. I know you watch. There was a hand over here. Yes, ma'am, Miss Maria. Okay. Be in prayer for Brother Val. Um, he needs to get an EKG and a clear report so he can get surgery for next Tuesday. So we'll keep you in prayer, brother. All right. Anybody else? All right. Let's take these before the Lord in prayer. Pastor, I got a praise. I guess that's allowed. I'm thankful I'm able to be here tonight. This time yesterday, if I moved, I, I mean, I'm out near the holler, and I had a bad two days, but today, thank the Lord, I'm doing real good. Amen. Amen. We thank the Lord, too. We miss you when you're not here, Gordon. Amen. Gordon's thankful for God sustaining him and bringing him back. He's glad to be at church tonight. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this night. Thank you for your blessings and the fact that you do hear our prayers. And dear Lord, each one of us sitting here, uh, we represent many answered prayers. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this room. And dear Lord, I think of the different ones we've had conversations with recently. For your healing, I thank you for Sam Ogg returning him to health. Um, senior that was dealing with COVID. I think of different ones, dear Lord, have been dealing with different things. Can Thank you, dear Lord, for bringing Miss Maria uh, back to church and just taking care of her. And we pray, God, that you'd be with those that were mentioned tonight. I do pray that you'd be with Miss Barbara Stahl. I pray that you'd be with Brother Mott. Help him to heal up. Um, also, dear Lord, continue to help Wade, that he would heal from his most recent hospitalization. Be with um, uh, Brother Dunsford as he's got two more treatments. Um, dear Lord, I also pray that you'd be with uh, Larry. Um, help his feet to heal up. Help them to, I know that's a, that's a concern, and I know it's got to be painful. Uh, take care of him. Uh, be with Beth as she's trying to cover things there at the park. Please send them help that would uh, just lighten the load and do a good job. And I uh, thank you, dear Lord, for the work that you're supplying for these men. I thank you for Brother Crockett and his business that you're taking care of. And uh, Lord, we thank you for your care on our life. Thank you for this church. 
And um, dear Lord, we thank you for uh, just an opportunity to serve you. Be with us tonight, Lord, as we study your word. Teach us, lead us along, and help us, Lord, see where we fit in. In your name I pray, amen. All right. If you would please take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. Last time we were studying in this passage, um, we saw where God led his people to a place of thirst. He led them to Rephidim. The word Rephidim means a place of rest, and it might have been a place of rest, but it was a place of thirst. There was no water there. And so the people, well, how do they respond? Well, you know, there's a couple ways that we can respond to thirst or to difficulty. I'll tell you how my kids respond when they're thirsty. They whine, right? Isn't that the way children do? And the Bible talks about Israel. It calls them the children of Israel. And so what did they do? Well, they whined. Uh, they blamed Moses. They said, Moses, how dare you lead us out here to kill us in the wilderness? You're going you're gonna to kill us through thirst. And, of course, if Moses had wanted to do that, he would have done it a long time ago. And they didn't just do that. They began to murmur. Well, Moses saw things were getting out of control. And um, he went to God for help. That's where they should have gone to begin with. And in full view of the elders of the tribes, God did something. God answered their prayers. And he says, take the representatives from the tribes. I'm going to stand on top of this rock. Something I hadn't seen before is that God in his presence showed him what rock. And he says, take your rod, the rod of God, and smite the rock. And Moses did, and water came out. That's a miracle. Now, God could have done a number of things. God could have showed them where to dig a well. Don't you know that? Yeah. yeah. But when God brought that miracle, he did so in such a way that nobody could ask and nobody could wonder. They couldn't say, well, maybe it was a natural phenomenon. Maybe it was something that man did. No, obviously, it was like you know, falling uh, bread from the sky. It was a miracle. And God gave them water sufficient for all the people to drink. Now, we don't know how long that water flowed. We don't know how long the people were there. But they were still at Rephidim when this second part of the chapter happened. Verse 8 says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So from thirst to provision and now right into battle. You know, in the passage at hand, God's going to bring them back to the classroom. Bring them to the classroom for another lesson. And it's interesting because they're attacked by the nation of Amalek. Israel was not a nation of warriors. They were slaves. They, they built pyramids, right? They labored all day long. They didn't go to combat training. They were not militarily ready for such an encounter. But, but really, that was the plan. God allowed something to happen that would teach them a lesson of warfare. And, and as I look at this passage, it becomes incredibly evident to me. Israel, the people of God, they were to live their lives as unto the Lord. They were to live in obedience to Him, in subjection to Him, really representing Him to all the world. So when people looked at Israel, they would draw conclusions about the way that Israel lived, and they would draw conclusions about God. Kind of like what people do about Christians, right? Right? We're supposed to represent Christ in the world today, are we not? Yes. We're supposed to. <clears throat> Listen, folks, when we live our lives guided by the Lord in submission to his word, relying on his strength, the battles that we fight are really his battles. If you're following the Lord, then where you are is where God has led you. If you're obeying the Lord, then what's in your path is what God has allowed to be there. If you are walking with God, then the battle you face is really not your battle. You know whose battle it is? It's the Lord's battle. And though that battle is greater than your strength, it's not greater than His strength. And what you need most is not more preparation, not more of your strength, but to be sure that you have His endorsement, His presence, and His power in the midst of that battle. I want to preach to you a message, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Now, I've heard this passage preached from a variety of different di directions, but as I, as I was studying it tonight, some things became vividly clear. Israel faces her first battle as a young nation. Now, if you remember previous to this, this is the first battle mentioned in Israel since she's come out of Egypt. Previous to this, twice God spared them from battle. The first time, the Bible says it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war. 
He didn't lead them close to the Philistines. He led them down into the Sinai Peninsula because he says if they see war, they're going to repent and want to go back to Egypt. God spared them from that. And then when Egypt came, you know, Pharaoh and all his armies, and he came and chased them down and cornered them by the Red Sea, what did God do? Well, they didn't have to fight. Pharaoh came down with all his chariots. Remember we said that was the equivalent of tanks back then, the artillery. And what happened? The Bible says the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and troubled the host of them and took off their chariot wheels that they drave heavily. And what did he do? He caved in the water on top of them and they drowned. So God spared them from battle. And then the second time the battle was upon them, God fought the battle for them. Well, here he's not going to do that. He's going to let them do some warfare on their own. But at the same time, he's going to teach them some things. He wouldn't spare them from singing, swinging a sword, but he would still teach them. Verse 8 says, notice, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel from Rephidim. Now, Rephidim, as best we can figure, is about 125, 150 miles from where Amalek was at the time. Now, Amalek's not around anymore, but on ancient maps, that's about what it is. So this wasn't the whole nation that came down and attacked Israel. Rather, it was probably a roving band of just, like, pirates on horses. I don't know if you called that, right? Um, they, they, were, they were wicked people, a band of raiders who would attack and rob settlements weaker than they were. Now, it's interesting, the, Amalek, the Amalekites were descendants of Esau, who were cousins to Israel. They didn't care. They were, they were wicked people. So what does Moses do? Here comes Amalek. They're going to fight. There's this group of warriors trained for battle, swooping in to, to pillage and destroy and burn and rob. Moses said unto Joshua, choose out men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. He says, go through the tribes and get chosen men. These would be men who looked like they could swing a sword, like they could fight. Right? You do this. You prepare to fight, not the whole nation, but chosen men, and I'm going to do something. While the men were fighting, Moses would support the battle in kind of a peculiar way. Look at what the Bible says. He says, tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. The rod of God. Now, they used to be called Moses' rod. Moses used this rod for 40 years while he was a shepherd in the, in the desert, and, and he would use that rod on the sheep. But since he had a meeting with God at that burning bush, this rod took on a new meeting. In Exodus chapter 4, God tells him, Thou shalt take this rod on thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. And multiple miracles had been done by Moses with God's power using the rod. He used the rod to turn into a snake. He used the rod to smite the water and turn it into blood. He used the rod when he parted the Red Sea. He used the rod when he smote the rock. This rod was an emblem of God's power. So it was used. In fact, having the rod of God was very close to something being in the name of God. Because it had God's endorsement and it had God's power. Remember we were talking about being in the name of Jesus? The endorsement of the individual and the power of the individual. The rod of God that Moses had, it had God's endorsement and it represented God's power. So when they fought, preceded by the rod of God, if the rod of God led them into battle, they fought in the name of the Lord. So if they're fighting in the name of the Lord, then whose battle is it, friend? It's God's, it's God's battle. That's exactly right. Do you see what Moses is doing here? So Moses takes the rod. He goes to a hillside where everyone can see him. And guess who could see him? Israel, who was in the battle. They would see the rod lifted up. They would know that this battle was being fought under the banner of God. But guess who else could see it? The Amalekites. The Amalekites, no doubt, who had heard of the Red Sea crossing, who had heard of the upset and the killing of Pharaoh, they would see this rod by which miracles had been done. They would know. You know what God was doing? For both sides, the results of this battle would be attributed to the rod of God and really more specifically to the God behind it. So what took place on that battlefield was going to be connected with this emblem. 
burned into their minds in eternity and for the nation of Israel. Now this is important because God's purpose, you know what his purpose for bringing Israel out of Egypt was? He said, I will be to you a God, you shall be to me a people. So when people saw Israel, they would think of the God of heaven. He was their God. When they were living in obedience to him, in submission to him, following the rod of God, their circumstances were ordained and endorsed by God. They were blessed by God. Their battles were his battles. Their victories were his victories. Their strength was his strength. And so the rod was very important. Look at what happens. Israel and Moses learn a lesson in battle. Two lessons here in verses 10 through 13. So they're going to go wage battle. The rod's going to be up on the hill. Both were needed. And what happens during the battle teaches us two lessons. Number one, it teaches us the need for God's power. And I hope you understand this. Each one of us here, each one of you following online, we need God's power to have the victory in our life. You need God's power. You cannot live the Christian life on your own. The battles you face, even if God allows you to face them, they are not meant to be fought in your strength. You cannot live the Christian life in your strength. Jesus said in John 14, without me you can do nothing. Nothing, nothing good. So the need for God's paddle, but power, but also the need for the support of God's people. Moses, who would hold the rod, guess what? He needed some help to support him. And we'll see this. Look at verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, this is the first time Hur is mentioned. This won't be the last time. He was a man who was behind the scenes doing all kind of things. Moses would lean on him. Joshua led these people into battle. He would become a military leader, in fact, taking up the reins after Moses. Moses went to the hillside with the rod. Joshua led into battle. Aaron and Hur went with Moses. You have all of these individuals and groups. And by the way, a bunch of men went with Joshua. So you got the guy swinging the swords. You got the guy leading the, the battle, the soldiers. You've got Moses carrying the rod. And you've got some support staff going up the hill. Do you realize that all of these different groups of people were very important in this battle? <laughs> Now, humanly speaking, if you were to look at a battle, you'd say, who is the most important person? Well, it's obviously the guy on the battlefield, <coughs> right? That's what the Marines would say, first to fight, right? Obviously the guy. Well, what about the person leading them? Well, I guess he's important too. But what about the leader who's relaying it? Well, I guess, I guess that's important too. What about his support staff? Okay, so that's important too. All of them were important. Yes. And, and we're going to see this this day. Look at verse 11. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand. Now, what was in his hand, folks? The rod. The rod. That's exactly. It wasn't that he was just holding up his hand, waving it in the air. The Bible says he took the rod in his hand. When he held up his rod in his hand, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. See, this battle was too great for Israel to physically win. That's what that tells me. It tells me that there were forces outside of this battle that were influencing the battle. And when those forces were not on Israel's behalf, guess what? This nation of slaves, couldn't, they couldn't hold a candle to Amalek. It was too great for their physical strength. But it was not too great for God's strength. Because when the rod of God was lifted, God worked on their behalf. When Moses held up his hand, the Lord's power was given them to win. When the rod was raised, they were fighting under God's banner, and they had God's strength and victory. So the key to victory that day, and in the days to come, after this battle, this, they would need to remember this, wasn't how many trained men they had. It wasn't how much combat training or how sharp their swords were, or if they got the element of surprise. The key to winning would be when God was fighting with them. Don't you understand that's the way it is in your life and in mine? The key to us living the Christian life and winning our spiritual battles and waging spiritual warfare and living for Christ successfully is when God is fighting for us. And to have God fight for them, they had to be following the rod of God, to obey God by faith, to trust Him. This was and still is the key to Israel's success. Obedience to the Lord brought the Lord's blessing. Disobedience to the Lord brought His chastisement. And Christian, for you 
and for me, do you know that the, the battle we face is greater than we can win in our strength? The battle for purity? Christian, you, you can't wage that in your own strength. The world is against you. The devil's against you. The flesh is against you. The battle for unity? Have you looked outside these walls? Everybody's fighting with one another. It's within human nature. We need God's help to have unity. For charity, to love one another? Try loving one another in your own strength. You know how far that will get you? That will get you just as far until you meet somebody who's really annoying. And then you're going to run out of charity, right? Mm -hmm. Now, do we have a banner that we follow? Is there a rod today? Mm -hmm. Is there something that we have that when we follow it, we have the endorsement and power of God? Yeah, you're raising your Bibles. You're exactly right. Christian, the equivalent for you and for me is not a rod or a staff that this preacher holds. It's this book right here. This is our rod. And when you and I follow this, in fact, the Word of God says, For the Word of God is powerful, quick, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's exactly what the Bible's talking about here. In the heat of battle, we don't need more of self. We need more of God's grace. The Bible says... That God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore. See, when you're following and walking according to God's word, when you're following this banner, do you understand when you follow this banner, God directs your steps? The steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Does that mean you're never going to lose a battle? No, it means you won't lose a war. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. This is our rod. This is our banner. So God's power was present when they fought under the emblem of the rod. Look at verse 12. In the midst of the battle, though, Moses needed something to hold forth the rod. Verse 12. This really spoke to me. Moses' hands were heavy. You ever tried to hold something up in the air for a long period of time? I enjoy lifting weights. I enjoy moving things and trying to get stronger and test this body. One of the things that will test you the most is to hold something isometrically above your head. Take a five-pound weight. You go, oh, this isn't very heavy, and you lift it up and down. All right, hold it above your head for an hour. I dare say none of us would succeed. Our bodies just get weak, and it gets heavy. Sometimes our head gets heavy, right? <laughs> Verse 12 says, Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now, some people have said um, that many believe that this represents Moses praying. And to be sure, the scripture has said many things about prayer, the importance of prayer. It, it ties together prayer and the lifting up of hands. Second Timothy 2.8, the Bible says, uh, it says, um, remember, that's not the verse I was looking. I was looking for 1 Timothy 2.8. It says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubting. So that's in there. But in the context here, the Bible is definitely talking about him holding forth the rod. Mm -hmm. yeah. Moses was holding up the rod, the emblem of God's power and endorsement. And after that day, listen, the visible rod became the emblem of an invisible God later on the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, 40 years later, when Israel tried to go into the promised land and God told them, no, you can't because you don't have faith. You know what they did? They went into the promised land without the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't have the presence of God, and they got whooped up on. Yeah. It didn't work. So this visible rod would be the emblem that God was with them. For the people to have God's power, they must follow his rod. But in order for them to follow his rod, guess what? Somebody had to carry it. Moses had to hold it forth. The man that God had chosen was Moses. Moses. And to carry the rod, to lead the people was a task. Now, it might not seem like a big deal just to carry a rod. But do you understand? That was a task too great for him. Yeah. Later on, Jethro is going to tell him this. He's going to say, hey, this is killing you. You need to let somebody else share the load. He couldn't do it on his own. God could have 
Now look what it says here in verse 12. Moses' hands were heavy, so that means he couldn't hold up the rod. Do you think God could have zapped him with some energy so he could just supernaturally hold that rod up on his own? Absolutely God could have done that. Well, Caleb, when he was 80 years old, he was, he was fighting giants and took a mountain and said, I'm as strong now as I was when I was 40. I know some 80-year-olds like that and a 90-year-old. Love you guys. God could have done that. But you know what it would have done? It would have stole the lesson from us that it's not always in just zapping one individual with strength. It's about other folks coming alongside and helping to share the load. That's what Aaron and Hur did. Aaron and her, Aaron his brother, and likely her, his brother-in-law, they didn't do anything super spiritual. They just gave him a chair. Look, it says they gave him a stone to sit on. They put it under him. That's not super spiritual, is it? Is that rocket science? No, but it was definitely needed. Extremely practical, behind-the-scenes stuff. And Aaron and her, what'd they do? They just held his hands up. No big deal. They just held his hands up. He sat down. They gave him a chair. Here, sit down on this chair. Here, they held up his hands. They didn't swing a sword that day. They didn't bear the rod that day. They weren't military ge geniuses and generals that day. But without their support, the battle would not have been won. You know, I believe this represents spiritual leadership. And I do believe this speaks of the role of the pastor in the church. As I look at this and the application to us... You know, it's my first, I'm your pastor, I love being your pastor. My first and foremost responsibility, you know what it is? It's to hold forth this right here. Amen. Yeah. Amen. When I was called to be pastor of Independent Baptist Church, I was asked about my calling and what I believe the primary responsibility of the pastor is. It hasn't changed. I believe the primary, first of all, responsibility of the pastor is to feed the flock of God, which is among you. Amen. Amen. And beyond that, that is my role. Beyond that, there are times that I need help. I don't need something super spiritual. I just might need somebody to prop my arm up. Somebody to give me a chair. And it's incredibly important. Can the pastor fill the role that God has called him to without help? No. No. I can't do it. No. What kind of help, pastor? Pastor. Well, the other things in the ministry that need to be done. You know, in the Church of Jerusalem, when they first invented deacons, do you know that deacons were invented in the Church of Jerusalem? Yeah, they were. That the, the apostles, the, the widows weren't being taken care of, and the apostles said, well, you know, it's not really good for us to stop preaching and praying to do these other things. Tell you what, let's look out seven men of honest report, and we'll have them, those men take care of things, and we'll, we'll call and have them do this stuff. Behind the scenes. It wasn't that they weren't willing. They said, but we'll give ourselves to preaching and to prayer. To the ministry of the word. By the way, that's a play on words. The word deacon comes from the word minister. And so they said, we're gonna, you minister to these other things. We're going to minister to the word of God and to prayer. It's a play on words. Sharing the load. In the midst of the battle, Moses need, learned this. That everybody's important. What did God do? Look at verse 13. It says, Joshua discomfited Amalek. With his, and his people with the edge of the sword. God gave the victory. By the way, it says Joshua did the fighting, okay? Joshua wasn't swinging the sword. He wasn't praying. He wasn't holding up the hands. It was God. God's including everyone here. Everybody was important. See, Joshua led the armies. The armies swung the sword. Moses holds the rod. Aaron and her supported Moses. And then when there was unity, when everybody was filling their role, that's when God gave his power. That's when the victory was given. So what does Moses do? Well, God had Moses record the day, verse 14. The Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Now, I'm not sure if he, had him, if he meant him writing the book of Exodus, because Moses was the human author, or if there was another book that he wrote and gave to Joshua. He says, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. See, Joshua would come after Moses. He would be the next leader. The Bible tells us this in the book of Joshua. We see it. Well, why does he need to have this rehearsed? Why do, why do you have to? Well, he'll tell us. Because I will utterly put out from remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. This nation that came and attacked you. By the way, remember what it said in, in Genesis chapter 12? Blessing I will bless thee, and cursing those that, those that curse thee, I will curse them. God's going to fight against those that fight against Israel. Mm -hmm. 
Remember that. It's still the case today, friend. It would need to be written down because God would wipe out Amalek. And though that would not take place until the reign of King Saul, God did perform this judgment. Look at verse 15. And this really spoke to me when I came to the end of this passage. I began to realize the application. Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. Do you know what that means? It means the Lord is my banner. Yeah. Right. The Lord is my banner. Banner. Back then, they would go into battle under a banner, representing the king who they were serving, like people do when they, when they uh, play sports today, right? And so people will go to a sports field, and um, you'll, you'll, you'll go to watch like a football game, and you wear the jersey of the people that you identify with, right? Or the, the, the team goes out on the field, and they all have this jersey. They're identifying with the team. And that's the way that battle would take place. You'd have a banner, the Lord is my banner. Well, if you're going in, into battle under the banner of the Lord, then the battle is the Lord's. And if the battle is the Lord's, it's his victory. Yeah. Amen. Moses learned and wrote down that the rod of God represents God's presence and endorsement, power on the people. When they went into battle or any other activity preceded by the rod, they had the presence and endorsement and power of God. And therefore, it was God who worked. But in order for that to happen... Everything else needed to fall in place too. The soldiers, the captain, the leader, his helpers, all had to have uni unity under the Lord's banner before the Lord gave his power. Do you see the picture in the application to the local church? Oh my goodness. In the end, it was God who was fighting, but there was no one who was unimportant. And you know, I believe the comparison rings true for us today. In your personal life, in your personal life, the battle you wage the spiritual warfare you're in, the temptation against the flesh, discouragement. Listen, it's too great for you. Amalek swoops in and attacks you, and you've got battles that swoop in and attack you on a regular basis, and you can't do it on your own strength. You know what you need? You need God's presence in your life. In the heat of battle, you need something that's going to give you strength. Friend, what is it that's God's rod today? just right here. This is given to you to give you strength in the heat of battle. Uh, listen to these scripture verses that speak of this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Successful Christian life, right? Yeah. Jesus said, if, my, if, if, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. That's answered prayer. He said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Where are those written, friend? Right here. Yeah, that's given to you. That's given to me to sustain us in life, to sustain us in, in, in warfare. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So do you realize how much you need the power of God's Word in your life? Man, we need it. And we've got it. This is the rod of God for you. Secondly, each of us has a role to fill as this church moves forward for the Lord. And whether you think it's big, whether you think it's small, insignificant, it's not a big deal. It's all needed. You know, Moses took, up, took the rod up to the mountainside. But if Joshua had not led the people into battle... They wouldn't have won the battle that day. Everybody needed to fight. Everybody needed to be included. Do you realize how much this church needs you? Each one of us here tonight, you following online, we need you. And as we follow the banner of the word, you in the trenches, me preaching, each of us helping, each of us plugged into the body, a body functions when all of its members are healthy. It is God who will give the strength to win the battle. You know, for many of us, you're in the battle already. It may be here tonight, and the first step is what you need to take. Maybe you need to take that first step, and the first step is to applying this to your, your life, to, to having God's Word power in your life. It's accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Maybe you're here tonight, maybe you're following us online, 
and you've, you're, you're in a battle, and you're in a battle in your spirit, but you don't know how to win, well, friend, you need God's power on your life, and that's by accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, that He died for your sins, that He rose again from the dead, that He'll save you, that He can help you if you'll simply accept Him, trust Him as God, and ask Him to save you. Maybe that God has spoken to your heart tonight about this message. I pray that's the case. Christian, the battle is the Lord's. But if we're going to have victory, you know what we need? We need this. We need this right here. This is God's power. And you know what else we need? We need to have unity, each one of us being involved. And then God gives the victory. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word tonight. I thank you for each one that is here. I pray, God, that you would help us. Help us as we seek to apply these truths, um, just, just to submit to your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, dear Lord, for them. We thank you for working. We thank you for the clarity. I pray that you'd continue to use this church, continue to work in our lives. Help us to submit to your word. In your name I pray, amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I'll give you just a minute to think about the message this evening. Talk to the Lord there in the quietness of your seat. Ask God how that He would have you to obey, to apply this to your own heart. Brother Peterson, would you please close us in a word of prayer, after which you'll be dismissed. Brother Peterson, would you please close us in a word of prayer, after which you'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the service tonight, and we thank you that we have a, a place to come and, and fellowship together.